All right. So I'd like to talk a bit about your career more broadly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think something that's interesting about your career is that it really spans this current era of architecture that we find ourselves in. You were there toward the beginning of the restoration movement, toward the beginning of the minimalist movement or the second golden age or whatever you want to call it. And you were helping to shape the direction of all of this, right? You were working for a firm that was right at the center of it, even though, you know, it sort of started as this kind of outsider band. Yeah. Now now it's at the, at the very center of what's happening in yeah. golf course construction, I think. So I'm excited to get your perspective on right. on how that's all unfolded. So if we go back to your the beginning of your career in, in golf architecture about 35 years ago or so, as I understand it, yep. it was somewhat unusual at this time to be interested in restoring golf courses. It's true. It wasn't obvious to many people or to many clubs that restoration as opposed to redesign or modernization was the way to go. So what got you interested in golf course rec- uh, restoration? Um, when I was in college, I went. To, I have an engineering degree from Michigan State or Michigan Tech, and um, luckily the gol- the president of the club or the of the the college was a golfer, and in the library they had they had Ron Witten's book, The Golf Course. Oh and my only, goodness! It was only him and me to ever check it out. <laughs> so you know, oh, that's wild. So the gol- was, you know, people, this book, its book is incredible. Whenever yeah, I ask anybody, how did this all start? So yeah. many people mentioned this book by Ron Witten. Yeah, it was his first version. And man, that was, I, 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 you could only check it out for two weeks at a time. And I'd put it back in the, li- the school library and all of a sudden he'd check it out and I'd be mad. So finally, one day I, I went here, they had like open, open visitation, chats with the president. And I walked in and it was usually people, you know, students bitching about something, you know, some political thing or something. And he, I walked in, I'm like, how come you're always checking out the, go- how come you're, you're stealing my book? And he looked at me and we became fast friends. He ended up being the uh, green chairman of Ventana Canyon out in the, when he re- re- retired out in uh, Tucson. But we sat there, he's like, I was a breath of fresh air, but um, you know, I studied that book forward and back and then, you know, sent out, 300 resumes you know that was the boom period right 1990 golf that's when national golf foundation was proclaiming we had to build a golf course for every day of the year you know to keep it up to the man so i saw all these resumes out and uh, had a bunch of job offers and mike luckily mike Hurdson had um, sent my resume over to ron force who had just started a year before that like maybe six months in the business and I thought that, you know, I was 30 at the time. I was an older student and you know, I was, I was a gal, I was an auto designer before that. So I was late coming in the, into the business at my age wise. And Ron gave me the best opportunity to start, you know, jump in right away. And Ron was, Ron was the big reason, you know, he was into the old architecture and, and uh, granted we were struggling just trying to get any job. We couldn't rebuild a green here or there, but um, the first course we worked on was Lancaster country club in, in Lancaster, Ohio. Oh, nine holes of Ross. Not, not Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jack, Jack Kittle, Kittleman, I think and Mike Hurdson and Kittle. I think it was Jack Kittleman. Uh, Mike there, There's a Bill Kittleman who worked no. with uh, um, Gil Hans for a while. No, that, was the pro, that was the pro at uh, oh, okay. uh, Marion. Uh, yes, Jack yeah, yeah, was you're right, you're uh, right. Mike Hurdson's original partner and did nine holes there. And when we 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 got the job and we started seeing these old drawings and how cool the Ross course was different from Jack's course. Um, that got us into that. And so Ron and I, uh, Tom and Gil, you know, Tom was like, I think working at Piping Rock via uh, via Pete at the time. So they were doing it and Brian Silva, you know, because he wrote that, that one article about Ross. We were the only ones doing this kind of stuff. Actually going around, you know, and, you know, Part of Ron's and my studies were going to see as many courses as we could. You know, we go consult somewhere and then go see 10 golf courses. So the more we went around, we realized, I think the the collective group of us, Tom and Gil and Ron and I and Brian, that, you know, most of these courses have been modernized, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, modern architects were better than the old masters. Nobody knew these guys. 
you know, until Frank Hannigan wrote that Hannigan wrote that wrote that article about Albert telling us nobody knew who he was. Um, so we were going around, and I was cold calling all these clubs and going, "Wow, you know," and just kind of peeling through the layers and seeing these old drawings that maybe these original architects were were pretty good and they were onto something originally. And so that's kind of how we started getting work. And, um, you know, so Ron and I, we built a few, a handful of golf courses, but that was, you know, that sparked my fire. This was fascinating. The history, doing the archaeology, and kind of how easy it was to see how things had changed. And I remember Mike, Mike Curzon told Ron, he goes, the best way to learn, you know, asked about me, like the best way he can learn is to go remodel or consult at clubs and learn how people learn from people's mistakes and learn from people's successes, how to be a good consultant. So I earned my chops with Ron. And then uh, three years later, I was, I was was kind of getting either homesick. I wanted to get back to Michigan, you know, Uniontown, Pennsylvania wasn't where, where it was happening for me and my wife. So I, I <clears throat> a few architects interested in bringing me on because I'd started to make a reputation for myself. And then Gil had left Tom at the time. And I'd, I'd call Tom like once a month and ask him some stupid questions. It was like Chris Farley, you know, Hey man, <laughs> it was really cool. What you did that. <laughs> and, uh, so he remember when, yeah, remember, he, remember when you built high point? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I called Bill core and he, he called me, you know, I called all those guys and, I was just bugging everybody because I was, I had a thirst for it. It was a passion for this. And uh, when Gil left, Tom heard that uh, I, I might be, uh, I had a job offer from Jerry Matthews, uh, was kind of a um, regional architect in Michigan. And Tom didn't like him at all. They didn't like each other. <laughs> and uh, I'm goes, you're not going to go work for Jerry. You had to come work for me. I'm like, okay. Good. Oh, that's classic. So Tom, no, okay, Tom, no. Tom was prompted to hire you because he heard that Jerry <laughs> Matthews was going to hire you. Yeah, didn't that's want me perfect. To good. You didn't want me to make him good. Oh, so, um, that's good stuff. So yeah. So then, um, you know, early on with Tom, we didn't have a whole lot of work. Um, but t- my deal with Tom is I used to, I got to keep doing consulting and that was, I've d- done that for 30 years now, and, you know, um, and I probably did while I was there for 17 years, I probably did 80, 80% of the consulting work for Renaissance, um, all on my own, my own jobs. And Tom was fine with that as long as it didn't interfere with new projects. So, um, when I was running Bally Neal or stream song or something like that, <clears throat> when the shapers would go home for two weeks, I would go build bunkers somewhere else and hmm. kind of built in, I had a built in business when I left Tom. Yeah, for sure. So early days at Renaissance golf design with Tom Doak. I assume it was more or less you, Tom, Jim Urbina, you know, in the mid nineties, that's pretty much it. What, what were those early days like in that firm? Oh, they're fun. You know, okay. We had so much fun. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of work. So, you know, Jim, Tom and Jared hired Jim just before Gil left and Jim was running Charlotte golf club. And, um, and so I moved to Traverse City, which was great for us, my wife and I, because we love Traverse City. And so the first year, I, you know, I just go over to Tom's Tom's house for an hour. We'd play with some drawings and get on the phone and try. We didn't even have an office. Try and you know drum up some work. And luckily, my consulting business, so as his, was doing fine, paying the bills, but not much. And then uh, I think the first job we got was either Evansville, Quail Crossing, I think of that, and that's where. Um, I didn't necessarily want to run. I wanted to learn how to shape. You know, Jim was a good shaper coming from the die, and Tom, you know, was an adequate shaper too. And and so I wanted. That's what I wanted to learn how to do. And so those early days where it was all ma- hands on deck, we brought Tom Mead on board. He was an ex superintendent, so it was kind of the four of us. And uh, you know, those early jobs in, uh, you know. If Jim would run a job, I'd help shape or vice versa. And um, then we started bringing on young talent. You know, when we were building Beach Tree in Baltimore, I, that was my first job to run on my own. And so Jim was shaping. I was doing some shaping. Tom Mead would come and do a little shaping. And then um, we had Brian Slonick was my intern for Michigan State. And he lived with me. And, uh, you know, that 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 I've told people that was a game changer bringing him on board because he mm. was all about the finish work, 
And, uh, but we'd all be on site, work all day, set up to sundown, just having a ball and then going out at night, going to the bars at night, drinking, hanging out. Um, just the camaraderie was insane. And then, you know, it kept building. Don Place got on board, you know, got brought in. Um, he started running the office that, so that got me out completely out in the field to shape and run projects. Then Eric Iverson came on, then Brian Schneider. And um, I remember when we were building, uh, we finished Cape, Ki- Cape Kidnappers. We had the Renaissance Cup, and I was in the cart with John Ashworth, who's a dear friend of all of ours who runs Link Soul now. And he goes, man, you guys are like, you guys are like the stones. <laughs> you know? He goes, you guys are having so much fun. You guys are rock stars. I'm like, I know, not really, but we do have fun. But, you know, those early days were just, you know, having that much talent on one job and just doing that, <clears throat> having fun, building great golf courses. And we knew we were building great stuff. You know, we were working for Tom. Yeah. So, you know, the, the energy was huge. And that team kind of came together over the course of the of the late '90s. It seems like yeah. right because you started as a very small firm and eventually assembled this uh, this all star now all star cast uh, around you. You know, so one thing that happened in those early days at Renaissance Golf Design was that Sandhills came yep. online. Big. I wonder what your memories are of the impact of that project or what impressed you about what they were doing, what was new, anything like that? How did Sandhills affect you back then? No, it was huge. You know, it was a game changer. It was, it was basically, if you build it, they will come kind of a deal, and you, you could build it anywhere. All you had to do was find great land. I remember talking to Bill, one of my dumb phone calls to Bill, you know, bugging him. He was talking about Sandhills. You know, it was still just in its infancy. He had just got back. He and Ben had just got back. From there, they were traveling around in a helicopter with Ron Witten, Doug Peterson, and uh, Dick Youngscap looking at sites. And he was telling me, he goes, Bruce, you, you, know, you know, Bill, he's so humble. He goes, Bruce, you're not going to understand how great this land is. <laughs> you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. So we don't know how this is going to work. And uh, we'd, all, <clears throat> we'd all heard the stories, you know, um, Dave Axelin and Dan Proctor were the great Finnish guys. And we always heard these stories about them hand raking the, the entire golf course or whatever. You know, it was all about finish work and the details. And that's what, you know, got Brian Slonick and all of us like really interested in that, you know, sand pro work, hand work, and hand edging bunkers, not bulldozers. And, you know, and that kind of turned us on. We're like, that's what we all want to do. That sounds cool. And, um, I did, I saw it just at, you know, I, shit, I spent five days there playing golf with these guys, you know, there. And it was just mind boggling. Like, this is, this is what should be done. And luckily Mike Kaiser became a member, saw that could be done. And then Mike started searching the world for great land and ended up in Oregon. And, you know, we got involved in that, but that it, it was the game changer. You know, we had a, we had an architectural event that Tom, you know, Tom is so selfless. He, he wanted to get all these architects together, you know, and not dictate the future, but talk about the future. So we had this event gathering with architects and we came and called it Archipelousa for a stupid name. <laughs> That's what we called it. And the first one was we invited everybody in the business to come and um, let's get all those architect, architects together. Some were very cool. And hash things out. You know, where's the future of architecture? Where are we going? That's how cool Tom is. He's that forward thinking. So we had it at the Sandhills. We figured if the only place is this is the future of golf. None of the main architects showed up. They sent all their associates, which are all dear friends of mine now, and they're all good, good architects now. They didn't want to come because they put their nose up to Tom. They didn't know him like Tom at the time. So Bill Coors there, you know, Ron Forrest, you know, Ian Andrews there, a lot, a lot of people. You know, a lot of cool, all the cool people in the business showed up to that thing. And we played golf. And that night we sat there and talked about things and we all introduced each other. And I, I, I got up in front of everybody a little nervous. And I said, you know, what you saw today is the benchmark we will all be judged at from this point on. This is how epic this place is. And some people are like rolling their eyes. But I knew that that was that will be the, mo- the most important modern course for the next hundred years, 
because it sets the tone of minimalism, finding great land, you know, finding golf on the land. And obviously having Bill and Ben do it at the same time, it's pretty cool. And it's true. That was the benchmark. And we're, we're always going to be judged on that. Granted, you know, I think Bally Neal's could go toe to toe. Pacific Dunes has an ocean, but you'll never, it's like Muhammad Ali. It's going to be the reigning champion forever. You're never going to knock him out. So don't try, but you're going to be real close second, you know? So I, you know, working for Tom all those years, that was our stride. We were, you know, Bally Neal, I spent a lot of time at Sand Hills learning from it. Mistakes, good things, bad things, whatever, wherever we could peel from that to make Bally Neal different. I didn't want to make Sand Hills 2.0. So I wanted to be completely different. And we did. You know, we on the mowing lines, the native edges, the positioning of the bunkers, things like that. I learned a ton from that golf course. Reminds me of the the Beach Boys and the Beatles going back and forth in the 60s mm -hmm. with uh, you know, the pet sounds, revolver. Mm -hmm. Sergeant Peppers, you know, just kind of raising the game 